At the time, all the members of the senior management team were white male professors. He is how the professor usually appears. However he appears, the professor is there because he is the chair. So when the diversity worker turns up, she finds that the room is already occupied. The chair was already there, as was another member of the committee who was also a white male professor. They were lounging around, they were confident, they were taking up time. And they were talking about the breakfast they used to have when they were students at Cambridge University, laughing, a shared memory of consuming bananas, apparently. A shared memory of consuming. A memory can be consuming. A memory can occupy space. A casual conversation about a past experience of an elite institution can fill the space. The space becomes elite for a select few. How a few are selected. A sense of ownership that spills out and spills over. Our space, our diversity committee, our university, ours. She said they did not stop talking to each other when she entered the room. The person who had sent them the papers that were on the table, they just kept talking to each other as if she was not there. Perhaps for them, she was not there. This practitioner said to me about her experience of turning up at a diversity committee only to find it already occupied, and her words have stayed with me because they got through to me. I realized how far away they were from my world. I realized how far away they were from my world. We learn a committee set up to transform a world can be how a world is reassembled. We also learn those of us who arrive into institutions that were not intended for us bring with us worlds that would otherwise not be here. So in the descriptions I've offered thus far by way of an introduction, I've deliberately made use of the vocabularies of youth, including the words used, usual, and unusual. So my task in today's lecture is to think about diversity and universities by starting with youth, a small word that has a lot of work to do, a small word with a big history. Youth has had and does have many uses. My arguments build upon the important critiques of how diversity operates within universities offered by Chandra Tape Mahanti, Gloria Vecca, Jackie Alexander, and Heidi Mirza. I'll be drawing on some of the data I collected for the empirical project on diversity work in universities, which I first discussed in my book, On Being Included, and returned to in the middle section of Living a Feminist Life, as well as introducing you to some new material from a project on complaint. I will also, <laughs> I'm being ambitious today, be introducing today some arguments from a book I've recently completed, which I've entitled provisionally, What's the Use? In the book, I follow use around the way I followed happiness and the promise of happiness and the will and willful subjects. And I followed use right back into the university. We could explore, for instance, how London University, which is now UCL, was established with the mobilization of arguments about useful knowledge. Many of those involved in the setting up of London University, such as James Mill, and Lord Henry Broman were also involved in the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge, which was established in the same year. So I'm not going to be addressing that history today. But I wanted to note that if following youth takes us back to the university, youth allows us to show how universities are assembled, as it were, brick by brick. When I visited the archives of the UCL, I was able to witness the history of decisions about how that university was to be built. So, for instance, on May the 6th, 1827, stones were brought to the building committee, Portland Stones and Edinburgh Stones, in order to help make a decision about which stones to use. I think of those stones at that meeting, on the table, as having a story to tell, the stones as part of the proceedings. So if bricks become walls, then stones become steps or stairs. Jay Domage has described how steep steps are material, but how they also create an idea of the university, their access to the university is a movement upwards. Only the truly fit survive this climb. 
So following youth has allowed me to reflect on how worlds take form around bodies and to connect bodies of work that would usually be kept distinct. Utilitarianism as an administrative and educational history with literatures on design and in biology that make use of youth to explain the acquisition of form. So this first section is called Uses of Youth. So in this section, I want to offer a meditation on use as a biography, as a way of telling a story of things. Use, when used as a verb, can mean to employ for some purpose, to expend or consume, to treat or behave toward, to take unfair advantage of or exploit, to habituate or custom. Use is a relation as well as an activity that often points beyond something, even when use is about something. To use something points to what something is for. Some objects are made in order to be used. We might call these designed objects. What they are for brings them into existence. A cup is made in order that I have something to drink from. It is shaped this way with a hole as its heart, empty, so that it can be filled by liquid. So we might uh, summarize the implied relation here as for is before. However, even if something is shaped around what it is for, that is not the end of a story. If for is before, for some things, what happens to those things is not fully determined by what they are for. As Howard Rosati notes in A Theory of Craft, use need not correspond to intended function. Most, if not all, objects can have a use, or more accurately, be made usable by being put to use. A sledgehammer can pound, or it can be used as a paperweight or lever. A handshaw can cut a board and be used as straight edge or to make music. A chair can be sat in and used to prop open a door. These uses make them useful objects, but since they are unrelated to the intended purpose and function for which these objects were made, knowing these uses doesn't necessarily reveal much about these objects. So use can correspond to intended function, but use does not necessarily correspond to intended function. And that not, not necessarily, is an opening. I'm not so sure if uses are quite as unrevealing about things as Rosetti implies, knowing these uses doesn't necessarily reveal much about these objects. I'm being told something about the qualities of a sledgehammer, that it can be used as a paperweight. That a sledgehammer can be used as a paperweight is telling me something about the heaviness of the sledgehammer. Something cannot be used for anything. If so, then, use is a restriction of possibility that is material. Nevertheless, there is something queer about use because intentions do not exhaust possibilities. The keys that are used to unlock a door can be used as a toy, perhaps because they are shiny and silver, perhaps because they jangle. So queer uses still reference the material qualities of things. So note the implication that use makes something usable. This strange temporality matters. What makes something possible can come after, and I think we're more used to thinking of possibility as precedence. Use can also make something used. When we think of something as being used, we might think of buying something secondhand, like this book, which was a book on hands that was handy, which I bought as a used book, which, as you know, a used book is usually cheaper than a new book. And the more signs of usage equals the less value. So this was quite cheap because the reader had underlined lots of parts of the book. Unless the user is esteemed when the value of a person can rub off on the value of a thing. So wear and tear usually means a depreciation of value. Marx discusses wear and tear in relation to machines. The material wear and tear of a machine is of two kinds. The one arises from use as coins wear away by circulating, the other from non-use as a sword rusts when left in its scabbard. So Marx showed in Capital how machinery intensifies rather than saves labor. You have to get the most out of the machine before it wears out. A wearing that is passed on to workers, wearing as, passing on, and passing out, used as, used up. So wear and tear in such an economy would be the loss of value determined by the extraction of value. To value use might require a change of values. To value use, 
would not be to romanticize what is preserved as a historical record. Signs of life can be signs of exhaustion, which is to say, signs of life can be signs of how a life has been extinguished. Perhaps we can think of youth as a record of the fragility of a life. So in writing about youth, I deliberately made use of used books. Used books are part of my archive. With this book in my hands, I can tell others have been here before. I think of the reader who circled the word grief, as you can see on the third line up, circling that word. I cannot trace you, but you left a trace. Use leaves traces in places. So something might be in use or out of use. When something breaks, it might be taken out of use, rather like this cup, which lost its handle, a rather sad parting. When we think of something in use, we might think of a sign on a door, occupied. The sign tells us that the toilet is in use. It tells us that we cannot use the toilet until whoever is using the toilet is finished. So use often is accompanied by instructions, and those instructions are often about the maintenance of social and bodily boundaries. Or take this image of a post box. There is a sign that politely asks the would-be poster not to use the post box by posting a letter into the box. So in the previous image, the toilet was occupied because it was in use. In this case, the post box is out of use because it is occupied. <laughs> Although, of course, from another point of view, it is in use. The post box has provided a home for nesting birds. So intended functionality can mean who something is for, not just what something is for. And this means that something can be used by those for which it was not intended. That a post box can become a nest still tells us something about the nature of an object. We learn about form when a change of function does not require a change of form. But that change still requires a sign, please do not use, a sign that is in use, because that sign is necessary to stop what would happen usually from happening, the letter being posted through the box, which would displace the birds. The sign we assume is temporary and the box will come back into use as a post box when it ceases to be a nest. Back into use. So use can involve comings and goings. Take this example of a well-trodden path. The path exists in part because people have used it. Use involves contact and friction. The tread of feet smooths the surface. The path is becoming smoother, easier to follow. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. How strange that this sentence even makes sense. Without use, a path can disappear, becoming overgrown, bumpy, unusable, rather like this path. You can hardly see the sign for the trees. So use can be necessary for preservation, use it or lose it. That is a mantra in personal training, apparently. But not only that, it can also become a philosophy of life. So a path can appear like a line on a landscape, but a path can also be a route through life. Collectivity can be acquired as a direction. The more a path is traveled upon, the clearer it becomes. A path can be kept clear or maintained. You can be supported by how a route is cleared. Heterosexuality, for instance, can become a path, a route through life, a path that is kept clear, maintained, not only by the frequency of use, and we can hear frequency as invitation, but by an elaborate support system. So when it is harder to proceed, when a path is harder to follow, you might be discouraged. You might try and find another route. A consciousness of the need to make more of an effort can be a disincentive. Just think of how we can be dissuaded by perpetual reminders of just how hard something would be. Deviation is hard. Deviation is made hard. Thoughts, feelings, they too have paths. Within empirical psychology, the path is in use as a way of thinking about thought. John Locke, for example, once suggested that thoughts once set a going, continue in the shape they are used to, which by often treading, are worn into a smooth path and the motion in it becomes easy and, as it were, natural. Used to, that which is wearing. A history of use is a history of becoming natural. William James, in his psychology, cites the work of Demont on habit. Everyone knows how a garment, having been worn a certain time, clings better to the shape of the body than when it was new. A lock works better after being used some time, at the outset, a certain force was required to overcome certain roughness in the mechanism. The overcoming of their resistance is the phenomena of habituation. 
a garment becomes more attuned to the body, the more the garment is worn. And I'll be returning to that image of the well-used garment in due course. The example of the lock and the key suggests that it's through use that things become easier to use. Less force is required to get that key through that lock. This is how acts of use are the building blocks of habits. If we take habit as our unit, we would miss those smaller steps which accumulate to take us somewhere. If use takes time, use saves time, less effort, effort is required to complete an action. The idea that use keeps something alive or that using something makes something easier to use is supplemented by another idea central to the emergence of modern biology, that use in making something stronger and disuse in making something weaker shapes the very form of organic life. So, for example, Lamarck, the French naturalist who first used the word biology in its modern sense, offered his law as a law of use and disuse, and he wrote, A more frequent and continuous use of any organ gradually strengthens, develops, and enlarges that organ and gives it a power proportional to the length of time it has so been used, while the permanent disuse of any organ imperceptibly weakens and deteriorates it and progressively diminishes its functional capacity until it finally disappears. These acquired modifications for Lamarck can be inherited, what he called use inheritance. So what is used or disused is dependent upon the environment. Use is how an organism receives a message from the environment about what it needs in order to survive. His famous example is the giraffe's neck, although he only uses that example once, which is interesting that an example is, has its own biography of use. So he argues that the giraffe's neck grows longer, not through volition, as his work is sometimes misrepresented as saying, but rather as an effect of repeated actions that become directional. That You could really do a queer theory reading of this quote, which I'm not going to do here. <laughs> you could. <laughs> Efforts in a particular direction, when they are sustained or habitually made by certain parts of the living body, for the satisfaction of needs established by nature or environment, cause an enlargement of the parts and the acquisition of a size and shape that they would not have obtained if these efforts had not become the normal, ac ac um, normal activities of the animal exerting them. So when an effort becomes normal, a form has been acquired in time. When such form is acquired, less effort will be needed. The giraffe does not have to reach so high to reach the foliage. So use inheritance, this is my language now, can be translated as the lessening of effort required to survive within an environment. At certain points, Lamarck does seem to imply that a use for something would be sufficient to bring that thing into existence. And this was one of the reasons that Charles Darwin was rather disparaging about Lamarck's work, because of the implication Darwin heard, rightly or wrongly, that nature has design. So we can find evidence of Darwin's disparagement in another used book, which is Darwin's personal copy of Lamarck's History Naturale, and this book is protected from the contact involved in use, use as the potential for degradation. And because of that, I can only show you a digital reproduction. So Darwin wrote on the margins, because use improves an organ, wishing for it or its use produces it, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And I'm writing about overuse and exclamation marks elsewhere. <laughs> oh! <laughs> So despite how now Darwin and Lamarck appear to deviate, at least from Darwin's point of view, on the question of use, Darwin himself often represents natural selection and the law of use and disuse as working together. He, he writes, natural selection would probably have been greatly aided by the inherited effects of the increased or diminished use of different parts of the body. And there's some scholars are so concerned about uh, Darwin's debt to Lamarck that, that there's one scholar who actually has counted the number of times that Darwin uses use in Origin of the Species and notice how he uses use more in the progressive new editions of that text. So the use of use has become a kind of live issue, even though it's not declared as such in the history of ideas. So it's interesting to note that Darwin offers a reuse of a classical metaphor for design, the architect metaphor, in describing the mechanism of natural selection despite the implication of design. And I'm going to read this quote to you as well because I, it's... Uh, going to be very suggestive for me shortly. Let an architect be compelled to build an edifice with uncut stones fallen from a precipice. The shape of each fragment may be called accidental. If the shape of each has been determined by the force of gravity, the nature of the rock, and the slope of the precipice, events and circumstances, all of which depend on natural laws. But there is no relation between these laws and the purpose for which each fragment is used by the builder. 
the shape of the fragments of stone at the base of our precipice may be called accidental, but this is not strictly correct. You can see a lot of uh, uh, hesitation in the argument. For the shape of each depends on a long sequence of events, all obeying natural laws on the nature of the rock, on the lines of the disposition or cleavage, on the form of the mountain, which depends on its upheaval and subsequent denudation, and lastly, on the storm or earthquake, which threw down the fragments. But in regard to the use to which the fragments may be put, their shape may be strictly said to be accidental. So use, use alone is what is accidental. The architect or the builder makes use of the stones without cutting them. The stones are thrown up according to natural laws, but they are not made in order to be used. They become useful to the architect only once he has begun building. So you are more likely then to use the stones that happen to fit the space. So Darwin here has a model of use as hap, or even as happy, and I'll be retur returning to his happy use of use in due course. So through reflecting on institutional use, we thicken the account of use that I've offered thus far. When we are habituated or attuned to an environment, we know what usually happens. Diversity workers are trying to transform what has become a habit, not to follow the well-used paths, not to go the way things flow. We learn about the institutional, as usual, from those who are trying to transform institutions. So doing diversity work often requires becoming conscious of use, confronting or bringing to the front what usually recedes into the background. And yet, at another level, diversity, at least as a word, seems to be the way things are going. So one diversity practitioner observed to me, I would say that the term diversity is just used now because it's more popular. You know, it's in the press, so why would we have equal opportunities? Well, we can just say it's diversity. We can just say it's diversity if diversity is just used now. So use becomes a reason for use, the circularity of a logic transformed into a tool. So many practitioners have suggested to me that diversity is just used now because of its effective qualities as a lighter, happier, or more positive term. Another practitioner describes, diversity obscures the issues. It can. Diversity is like a big, shiny red apple, right? And it all looks wonderful, but if you actually cut into the apple, there's a rotten core in there, and you know that it's actually all rotting away and it's not actually being addressed. It all looks wonderful, but the inequalities aren't being addressed. So diversity might be used because of what it allows organizations not to address. So intended functionality can be used to refer not only to the intended function of an object, but to what is stated, at least, as the intended function of an action. And there is a gap between what is being stated or given expression as intention and what is being done. So diversity work is often about minding the gap. Sometimes you have to use words more because of what is not being done. Another practitioner noted, I think it, she's talking about equity, became a tired term because it was thrown around a lot. And I think, well, I don't know, because our title is equity and social justice. Somebody the other day was saying to me, oh, there's equity fatigue. People are sick of the word equity. <laughs> oh, well, uh, we've now gone through equal opportunity, affirmative action, they're sick of equity. Now what are we going to call ourselves? They are sick of it because we have to keep saying it because they are not doing it. <laughs> we use a word more because we are not getting through. The more we use a word, the harder it is to get through. Words here seem almost the opposite of muscles. The more you use the words, the floppier they become. They become looser, less tight, less precise, less sharp. This argument contradicts what has been called the law of exercise, which is the law that informed Lamarck's first law of use, where to use is to strengthen. And that contradiction needs to matter to a theory of use that is robust enough to explain different uses of use. So, diversity does less because it is used more, or diversity is used more because it does less. I think this or is and. So even if diversity workers are appointed by institutions to transform them, it doesn't mean that institutions are willing to be transformed. So one practitioner described her work thus. It's a banging your head against a brick wall job, and a job description becomes a wall description. <laughs> if you keep banging your head against a brick wall and the wall keeps its place, it is you that gets sore. And what happens to the wall? All it seems is that you've scratched the surface. And this is what diversity work often feels like, scratching the surface, scratching at the surface. But even if you've only scratched the surface, you can still be liable for damages. 
Doing diversity work means you collect wall stories, as I called them, and living a feminist life. So the wall becomes data. And I'm going to share with you a wall story. It's long, as most wall stories are. <laughs> when I was first here, there was a policy that you had to have three people in every panel who had been diversity trained. But then there was a decision early on when I was here that it should be everybody, all panel members, at least internal people. They took that decision at the Equality and Diversity Committee, which several members of the senior management team were present at. But then the Director of Human Resources found out about it and decided we didn't have the resources to support it. And it went to council with that taken out. And council were told that they were happy to have just three members. Only a person on council was an external member of the Diversity Committee went ballistic. And I'm not kidding, went ballistic. And said so the minutes didn't reflect what had happened in the meeting because the minutes of the decision was different to what actually happened. And I didn't take the minutes, by the way. And so they've had to take it through and reverse it. And the council decision was that all people should be trained. And despite that, I have then sat in meetings where they just continue saying that it has to be just three people in the panel. And I said, but no, council changed their view and I can give you the minutes. And they just look at me as if I'm saying something really stupid. This went on for ages, even though the council minutes definitely said all panel members should be trained. And to be honest, sometimes you just give up. So it seems as if there has been an institutional decision, but individuals within the institution must act as if the decision has been made for it to have been made. If they do not, it has not. So a decision made in the present about the past, a decision made in the present about the future is overridden by the momentum of the past. The past becomes like that well-worn path. What usually happens still happens. So in this case, the head of personnel did not need to take the decision out of the minutes for the decision not to bring something into effect. I call that dynamic non-performativity when naming something does not bring something into effect, or when something is named in order not to bring something into effect. So the wall is that which keeps standing. I think of the wall as a finding, and we can summarize that finding. What stops movement moves. In other words, this, the, the mechanisms for stopping something are mobile, which means when we witness the movement, we can miss the mechanism. And I think this is very important because organizations are quite good at generating evidence of movement, of just how much they're doing. And this is why I call diversity workers institutional plumbers. We have to work out not only where something is blocked, but how it is blocked. In our example, what stops something from happening, it, it could have been the removal of the policy from the minutes, in which case the head of, he would have had a hand in the decision not working. It could have been the failure to notice this removal on council. But it wasn't. It was the way in which those within the institution acted after the policy had been agreed. So agreeing to something can become another way of stopping something from happening. This means that a diversity policy can come into existence without coming into use. So I noted earlier how a sign is often used to make a transition from something being in and out of use, such as in the case of the post box. So institutions are postal systems. Maybe the diversity worker deposits her policy in the post box because she assumes the post box is in use because she's been told it's in use. But the post box that is not in use might have another function to stop a policy from going through the whole system. So the policy becomes dusty, rather like Marx's rusty sword, from rusty to dusty. A policy becomes unusable by not being used. Consider then all of the energy that the practitioner expended on developing that policy that doesn't do anything. The story of how the wall keeps standing is the same story as the story of how a diversity worker becomes shattered. She says, sometimes you just give up. Maybe you end up feeling used up, limp, spent, rather like this tube of toothpaste. Or maybe you fly off the handle to recall that broken cup an expression that can mean to snap or to lose your temper. To lose a handle on things can mean to lose yourself. You become the one who can't handle it. You don't have to say anything to be heard as breaking something. Another practitioner describes, you know, you go through that in these sorts of jobs where you go to say something and you can just see people going, oh, here she goes. We both laughed recognizing that each other recognized that scene. The feminist killjoy, that leaky container comes up here. She comes up in what we can hear. We hear each other in the wear and the tear of the words we share. We hear what it's like to come up against the same thing over and over again. We imagine the eyes rolling as if to say, well, she would say that. 
It was from experiences like this that I developed my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. <laughs> I think it's important to note that the policy that was stopped by not being used was a policy about how academic appointments are made. A university is shaped by a history of appointments. When I attended the UCL archives, I got a sense of the shape of that history. The secretary, the then secretary, wrote letters in response to all of those who expressed interest in teaching at this new university. Once you'd read one of these letters, you might as well have read them all. They were standardized, and a standard is what you create when you use the same form. But then one letter jumped out. It was a letter sent in response to Professor Johann Friedrich Meckel in 1827, who was a professor of considerable standing in his time, a Lamarckian by coincidence. What is striking about the letter sent to Meckel was just how the standards were suspended. The letter is long and personal and gushing and enthusiastic. Yes, come and work for us, yes, yes, Meckel. The suspension of what is usual is usual. I know of recent cases, hundreds of years later, where the usual procedures are bypassed to enable the recruitment of such and such star professor, even though this bypassing in the UK is a bypassing of the equal opportunities procedures that are supposed to be compulsory. We can begin to appreciate a difficulty here. Diversity workers often try to develop new procedures to stop the reproduction of the same thing, but those procedures can be suspended to enable that very reproduction. Appointment panels are thus places to go as ethnographers if you want to learn more about how institutions are reproduced, how decisions are made, about who is appointable. That's the word they use in the British context all the time, appointable, is, are they appointable? A person in a diversity training session I attended shared with me that people in her department use an unofficial criteria for appointability and that was whether somebody was the kind of person you could take down the pub. They wanted someone who could inhabit the spaces with them, being with as being like, someone they could relate to, drink with, being with, being like. I remember one time a woman of colour was being considered for a job in my department. She worked on race and sexuality, and someone said in the departmental meeting, with concern, but we've already got Sarah, as if having one of us was more than enough. <laughs> There was a murmur consensus that she replicated me, even though our work was really different. And there was no such concern about other areas. Concern, no concern. How things stay the same by seeing others as the same. So I want to go back to my discussion of uses of use. Institutions are environments, and environments are dynamic. It is because environments change that uses change. An institution, however, also works as a container technology. You can reproduce something by stabilizing the requirements for what you need to survive or thrive in an environment. Once these requirements have been stabilized, they do not have to be made explicit. Use becomes instead a question of fit. Remember Darwin's use of the architect metaphor. The builder uses the stone that happens to fit. An institution too is built. So it appears as if the moment of use is hap that this person just happens to fit the requirements, that this stone just happens to be the same shape and size as that hole in that wall. But once a building has been built, once it has taken form more or less, some more than others will fit the requirements. Indeed, HAP is then used ideologically, as if they are here because they just happen to fit, rather than they fit because of how the structure was built. So a structure is a gradual removal of HAP from use in the determination of a requirement. In the Marx model, use becomes inheritance. In shaping form, it lessens the effort required to do something within that environment. So when you fit, and fitting here can be formal, a question of form, you inherit the lessening of effort. So a path, say in the sense of a career path, or a, a, a life trajectory for that matter, is not simply made more usable by being used. Some have paths laid out more clearly in front of them because they already fit a requirement. In other words, it's not just constancy of use that eases a passage. Use is ease for those who inherit the right form, whereby rightness means a degree of a fit with an expectation that does not have to be articulated explicitly. So for as before acquires a new resonance here. When a world is built for some, they come before others. This third section is called Occupy. So people do come to inhabit organisations that are not intended for them. You can make the cut without fitting. If you arrive into an organisation that is not built for you, you experience a for as tight or as a tightening. 
If you are the one for whom an institution is intended for might be loose, you might experience the institution as open because it was open to you. If use is a restriction of possibility that is material, as I suggested earlier, some encountered that restriction more than others. That's why I think of the institution as like an old garment. It has acquired the shape of those who tend to wear it, such that it becomes easier to wear if you have that shape. This is also why I've described privilege as an energy-saving device. Less effort is required to pass through when a world has been assembled around you. If you arrive with dubious origins, you're not expected to be there, so in getting there, you've already disagreed with an expectation of who, it, who, who you are and what you can become. Then an institution is the wrong shape, it just doesn't fit. Annette Kuhn describes how as a working class girl in a grammar school, she felt conspicuously out of place. And she describes the sense of being out of place by giving us a biography of her school uniform, how by the time her ill-fitting uniform came to fit, it had become shabby and scruffy. The word wear originally derives from the Germanic word for clothing. It then acquires a secondary sense of use up or gradually damage from the effect of continued use on clothes. So it's not just that when something is used, it fits better. If you are the wrong shape, you have to make more of an effort. Use then does not smooth a passage or enable a better fit, but leads to corrosion and damage. And that difference, whether smooth, use is smoothing or corroding, is distributed throughout an organization. So not fitting can be about the body you have, about your own requirements. And when you don't meet the requirements, you become, to borrow Rosemary Garland Thompson's important term, a misfit. She describes being a person with a disability in an ableist institution as like being a square peg in a round hole. Fitting becomes work for those who do not fit. You have to push, 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 and sometimes no amount of pushing will get you in. You can be a misfit given what has become a routine. An organization that organizes long meetings without any breaks assumes a body that can be seated without breaks. If someone arrives who cannot maintain this position, they do not meet the requirements. If you have to lie down during a meeting, you might throw the meeting into crisis. And I would argue social justice projects require throwing usage into crisis. The misfit exists in close proximity to a killjoy. If a meeting has been planned in a room that's not accessible to those with mobility restrictions or at a time that is not possible for those with caring responsibilities and a request is made for the room to be changed or the time change, that request is typically heard as being difficult or being negative or being demanding as imposing your will and your needs upon others. You shouldn't have to ask for a room change or a time change in order to be accommodated. But if you do have to ask, your request becomes theft, as if you're stealing their time in their room. So diversity work is often heard as complaint or as being complaining. So if a space has to be modified to enable you to participate, it is not just that it is harder for you to participate, although it is harder for you to participate, it's also that your participation is deemed as being disruptive to others. You stop how things usually flow. So fitting becomes also about fitting in, the work you have to do to try and fit in in order to be less disruptive than you already are. One woman of colour describes this work in this way. I think of a person of colour, there's always a question of what is this woman going to turn out like? They're nervous about appointing people of colour into senior positions. Because if I went in my sari and wanted prayer time off and started rocking the boat and being a bit different and asserting my kind of culture, I'm sure they'd take it differently. So some forms of difference are heard as rocking the boat, as if you're only different because you're insistent on being different. Trying not to cause disruption might require discarding parts of yourself, parts of your own history, such as garments, or saris, say, or rituals, or prayer. It might be about words, about the words that you cannot say. I suggested earlier that the word diversity might be used more because it does less, as well as do less because it's used more. Let's think of another word, the word racism. Audre Lorde describes so well how racism is heard as getting in the way of smooth communication. She uses the language of smooth very effectively. Any use of the word racism is heard as overuse. You can just say it once, and it's like that's the only word you say. It's all, the only word that's heard. It's, it fills the room. So when words evoke histories that create fiction, they catch attention, they sound louder. Words evoke histories, bodies too. Sometimes turning up is enough to bring a history up, a history that gets in the way of other people's occupation of space. So a social category I think of as a dwelling, as that which gives residence. 
We can call the sign occupied. We can enter if the toilet is vacant. Even spaces that seem available for anyone to enter can be closed. Before you get to one door, you might have to get through another. You can be stopped from using the women's toilet because you're seen as not women. You become not only a body out of place, but a body that threatens those who are in place. You might have to become insistent to pee, and given that peeing is necessary for being, insistent to pee really means insistent to be. Some have to insist on belonging to the categories that give residence to others. The university, too, is occupied. The occupation leaves traces in places, on walls, portraits of dead white men as reminders of who the university is for. Their names might be up there on buildings. I was in at Columbia earlier today, so what's the name? <laughs> One thinks of UCL, where you can encounter Bentham and his dead body, well, minus a head or with a wax head. Or you can enter a lecture room named after Francis Galton, who coined the word genetic, uh, eugenics and who donated considerable funds to enable the setting up of a program in national eugenics, as well as a professorship of eugenics, which was taken by his student, Pearson. UCL has removed the word eugenics from the program and the professorship and replaced it with the word genetics, perhaps because <laughs> eugen eugenics is too revealing, too contaminated by history, lose the word, keep the thing, not using as reproducing. They have kept Galton's name, however. When asked to justify the continued use of Galton's name all over the UCL by a member of the audience at a panel, Why Isn't My Professor Black?, the Pro Vice Chancellor of UCL said, In my defense, I inherited him. Use inheritance becomes use as inheritance. Histories can come in with who comes in. You can be stopped from using a space by how others are using a space. A woman of color academic describes to me how she set up a reading group and a writing group in her department. These groups quickly became occupied by senior men, in her terms. What I found in each of the meetings were senior men who were bullying everyone in the room. Those who have power can influence and direct discussions, often by undermining the confidence of others, students or more junior staff. The first session was someone being just really abusive about someone's PhD, saying it was rubbish. She describes how a racist comment was made during one session. Someone said, I'm from London, and London is just ripe for ethnic cleansing. She described how everyone laughed. When laughter fills the room like water in a cup, laughter is holding something, holding on to something. It can feel like there's no air, nothing left. She put it. These were the sorts of things being aired. These were the sorts of things. A sentence is a sentencing. Violence thrown out can be how you're thrown out. Aired. Even the air can be occupied. I spoke to this academic as part of a new research project on complaints, and I'm talking to those who have had or, ha or considered making formal complaints about abuses of power within universities. It's very early stages of the project. So she decided to complain because she wanted it recorded and because this was a culture that was being reproduced for new PhD students. She complained because she wanted to record what was happening and to stop what was happening from happening. Her complaint didn't get anywhere, and even though the complaint was collective, she gathered testimonies, anonymous testimonies, from 20 staff in her department. She was described by the head of human resources as, quote unquote, having a chip on her shoulder. So the killjoy pops up here, it's not long ever before she turns up, as an explanation of critique as well as complaint. As if we say what we say and we do what we do because we suffer from a personal grudge or grievance. We learn about power from how challenges to power are dismissed. We can return to that statement, I inherited him, to justify the continued use of Galton's name. Use inheritance might refer here to the mere fact that upon arrival, some things are already in use. But what if inheritance could also be understood as kinship? Inheritance is not simply what is received, but what can be received by whom, those who are the right kind, whiteness as kind. Inheritance is how what is received is reproduced. To try to intervene in the reproduction of that inheritance means making a complaint. And this is why making a complaint often requires becoming a diversity worker. You're brought up against the organization, especially if a complaint is a chip at the old block. Chip at, chip off. The expression chip off the old block evokes paternity, the son who is like the father who will eventually take his place. So if you chip away at the old block, no wonder they find that chip on your shoulder. So I'm at the very early stages of this research, as I mentioned already, and I'm learning so much about the institutional, as usual. 
A complaint can teach us about the continuity of abuses of power with the use patterns of an institution. And by use pattern, I'm not referring to official policies. I'm referring instead to how a university is occupied, how a network can come alive to stop a complaint from getting through, rather like how electricity travels through wire, hiring as wiring, hiring as wiring. Lines of communication are well-worn paths through an organisation. The more a path is used, the more a path is used, the more he's connected, the more he's connected. When you follow a complaint procedure, in the UK at least, you are usually asked to go through the official networks, first talk to the person concerned, if there's a person concerned, then your personal tutor, a colleague, a head department, and so on. This is why a complaint, complaint can function like a switch, or an alarm, or an alert that triggers a reaction. When a network comes alive, it is an order to protect those who are the most networked, which is to say, a network can be how a complaint is stopped. By listening to those who have made complaints and about a range of different abuses, disability discrimination, transphobia, plagiarism, sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, um, have been what things that have come out so far. Um, I've been learning about the different methods through which complaints are stopped. Those who indicate that they might make a complaint are often warned that by complaining that they would damage themselves, that they would damage their careers, their reputations, their, uh, their relationships. Warnings can, can be expressions of care. If you do this, it could cause you trouble. But they can also be threats. If you do this, then you would lose the connections that you need to progress. One student describes... I was repeatedly told that rocking the boat or making waves would affect my career in the future and that I would ruin the department for everyone else. I was told if I did put in a complaint, I would never be able to work in the university and that it was likely I wouldn't get a job elsewhere. So here complaining becomes a form of self-damage as well as damage to others ruining a department, no less. This student went on to describe how the pressure not to complain was exerted. In just one day, I was subjected to eight hours of gruelling meetings and questioning almost designed to break me and stop me from taking the complaint any further. So a wall can be what comes up, or a wall can be what comes down, like a ton of bricks. And this is how power often works. You don't have to stop people from doing something. You just make it harder for them to do something. Remember, deviation is hard. Deviation is made hard. Another student described what followed making a complaint. We were accused of having caused a disruption in their studies. They valued their desire to have him as a professor over those who were suffering psychologically because of his harassment. I was told I should have consulted the whole class before going ahead of a complaint. We need to be in solidarity with those whose education was now being disrupted, not the other way around. So to complain about harassment is to be judged as cutting yourself off from a collective. And then you are cut off from a collective. And this means that to complain can mean having nowhere to go, no route through, no path through the organisation. And this is why creating feminist support systems remains incredibly important. We need to give those who make a complaint somewhere to go. Sometimes it can seem that we have two options, to get used to it or to get out of it. For those who cannot afford to get out of it, and many can't afford to get out of it, then getting used to it becomes the survival strategy. An effort, say, to try and minimise damage, it is a partial and a failed resolution to a crisis. This is now my uh, conclusion called Lifting the Lid. Diversity work is the work of trying to dismantle the structures that do not accommodate us. I used to think that I was collecting data on diversity work, but I came to realize that diversity work is data collection. We know so much from what comes up because of what we bring up. We learn from the consequences of the work that we are doing. We learn even from the damage we cause or from how our cause is understood as damage. When I shared the reasons for resigning from my own post in protest at the failure of the institution to address sexual harassment as an institutional problem, I quickly became the cause of damage. I became a leaky pipe, drip, drip. Organisations will try and contain that damage. The response, in other words, is damage limitation. This is how diversity often takes institutional form damage limitation, Hine, happy, shiny policies put in place, holes are left by departures filled without reference to what went on before, a blot becomes something to be wiped up and wiped away, mopping up a mess. But there is hope here. They cannot mop up all of our mess. A leak can be a lead. 
a leak can be a feminist lead. When I shared my reasons for my resignation, many people shared with me their own stories, their own institutional battles. When you lift a lid, more and more comes out. Just loosen the screws a little bit, a tiny, tiny little bit, and you might have an explosion. We need more explosions. Diversity Workers Data Collection, it's explosive what can come out. This is why professional norms of conduct are about keeping a lid on it. Institutional loyalty is silence in case of institutional damage. We might collect more data the less professional we are. Earlier I described diversity workers as institutional plumbers. We might from this description assume that diversity workers are appointed to unblock the system. But a blockage is how the system is working. The system is working by stopping those who are trying to transform the system. To transform a system, we have to stop the system from working. We might need to pass as plumbers in order to become vandals. So it might think that we're fixing the leak, but really we're making it bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Vandalism is described as the willful destruction of what is venerable and beautiful. We might have to throw a wrench in the works or to, be to become to use Sarah Franklin's terms, wenches in the works, to use our bodies, to throw our bodies into the system, to try and stop the same old bodies from being re reproduced, assembled, doing the same old things. Same old, same old. So much is re reproduced by the requirement to follow. Within the academy, you might be asked to follow the well-trodden paths of citation. To cite properly is to cite those deemed to have already the most influence. That's what a good manners is, to cite those who are already the most cited. The more he is cited, the more he is cited. The more a puff is used, the more a puff is used. If we think of how a syllabus is occupied, we learn to the occupation depends upon erasure, displacement. We learn to the occupation depends on that displacement. Such and such white man becomes an originator of a concept. An idea is becoming seminal by removing traces of those who were there before. Removing traces, removing traces. Not following something is destroying something. You can become a vandal by rearranging a text in a different way, by not citing any white man, for instance, which was my citation policy in living a feminist life. <laughs> which I really miss in this new book, because I'm writing about the history of utilitarianism. I had to include lots of dead white men. Okay. <laughs> to, speak, to speak of whiteness in the academy, to speak of whiteness in the academy, or of colonialism, as the context in which Enlightenment philosophy happened is to bring up the scandal of the vandal. Decolonizing the curriculum as a project has been framed uh, as an act of vandalism, a willful destruction of our universals, knocking off the heads of statues, snapping at the thrones of the philosopher king. The one British newspaper sort of mourned, oh, we can't teach Kant in response to a campaign by students at SOAS. The question raised about the use of Galton's name during Why Isn't My Professor Black panel, which led to a, a, a wider and meaningful discussion of the role of Galton's legacy, was, you might be interested to know, represented by the media as a Galton must fall campaign. But there was actually no such campaign. It was invented by the media. I mean, I think I would support that campaign if it did exist, <laughs> but it didn't. And what's interesting here is that even raising the question about what it means to reproduce an inheritance is understood as a censorship, as a stopping, as a destruction, as the end of a line. So to be a vandal is to damage what you're supposed to revere, to bring an end to what you were supposed to reproduce. If talking about sexism and racism damages institutions, we need to damage institutions. We have to stop what usually happens from happening because we know that however much spaces have been occupied, they can be freed up when they are inhabited by those for whom they were not intended. In a protest, we aim to cause disruption to usage. When you occupy a building, you are stopping it from being used as it is ordinarily used, business as usual. So no wonder protest is often framed as vandalism, damage to property. So vandalism becomes a useful tactic when we have to cut a message off from a body, when a message, if traced to a source, would compromise that source, or when you have to bypass official procedures to avoid sending out an alert. We might need to use guerrilla tactics, write names of harassers on books, turn bodies into art, write graffiti on toilet doors or on walls. Yes, so scratches. We are back to those scratches. Feminism becomes a message we send out, writing on the wall. We were here and we did not get used to it. Thank you.